Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Has everybody made it here yet? All right. I like to start off our sermons with a fun fact. I have more of a, uh, of a story for you today, though. So I think everyone in this room is probably familiar with Martin Luther. I think all Christians should be familiar with who Martin Luther is. He's most known for his actions at uh, Wittenberg Church in 1517, where he nailed his 95 theses or 95 statements to the castle door. Uh, Martin Luther had 95 reasons why the teachings of the Catholic Church were not biblical. He was particularly harsh against indulgences, which is a practice where you take and you basically pay money so that you can live however you want to do. And he, he was very much against this. Through that action, Martin Luther, in his own words, hoped to start discussion and debate about why indulgences were bad and not biblical. This action led to much, much more. This is what we consider the beginning of the Christian Reformation, or the breaking away from the Catholic Church, and the beginning of going back to biblical Christianity. This was the, and it's not anything that Martin Luther did. This is the action that God took through Martin Luther. He simply used Luther to take these actions. Now, uh, remember that this was 1517. When he did these, when he took this action, and I think it's kind of funny to note when you think about Martin Luther going up and nailing the the, the statement to the church door, we we tend to think of of a really, you know, an old educated monk. He was 34 years old when he did that. He was a priest and a theology professor. Uh, so having an unpopular opinion was kind of edgy. He didn't know how far exactly it would go, though. See, the indulgence preachers of the day took a great offense to his positions and basically started what was a propaganda campaign against Martin Luther. And because of the controversy and the public nature of what would happen, uh, some historians have called Martin Luther the first celebrity outside of royalty. In other words, Everyone was talking about this. This was, this was the issue of the day. Uh, it was so publicized that, that uh, he nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg on, uh, excuse me, in 1517. In 1521, he was excommunicated from the church. Remember, this is 1517, he was, a priest. he was a priest and a theology professor. Being excommunicated is dangerous. That was in April. In May, they convicted Martin Luther of heresy. That comes with a death penalty. Being convicted of, as a heretic means that you're to be captured and killed on sight. It means you're to be burned at the stake. Luckily, God again intervened through other believers and hidden Martin Luther away for many years in another castle until other issues became pressing and uh, the authorities basically had other things to deal with. But this was the action that started the Christian Reformation. That was October 31st, 1517. Today! Isn't that something? But we don't celebrate anything to do with the Reformation on October 31st. Not as Americans. There is a uh, celebration known as Reformation Day, a very small part, uh, portion of the population even recognizes it as a holiday. What is today? It's Halloween. Exactly, ask anyone. Today's Halloween, October 31st. It's the start of the holiday season. You have Halloween, in the next two months you have Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. 
For some reason, Halloween's considered a minor holiday. I don't really understand that because in 2019, 70% of Americans celebrated Halloween. I don't think there's anything minor about that. Do you really think it's a coincidence that we celebrate Halloween, the day of all things dead and ghosts and ghouls and monsters, on the same day that God started the, coming, the, the bringing of his church back to biblical truth? On the same day that he started the Christian Reformation? Do you think that's a coincidence? Come on. There's no way. This is how the devil works. And this is what we're going to get into. This is a clear counterfeit, a corruption of another truth of God. This is how the devil works. If we really look at where Halloween came from, the, the Catholic Church celebrates a day called All Hallows Day. Uh, it used to be celebrated in May. They moved it to November 1st. It's All Saints Day is what we call it today. Uh, it's officially known as All Hallows Day. Hallows meaning holy. The day before, All Hallows Day is All Hallows Eve. Hallows Eve turned into Halloween. Just took a little bit of time. That's where we get Halloween from. The celebration of All Hallows Day is a very Catholic holiday. It's a lot of fasting and prayer for dead people and dead relatives. And it's, uh, it's all about the dead. And it's, it's very morbid. There's a reason they moved All Hallows Day from May to November 1st, and it was to correspond with other pagan festivals. See, the church was very good at this. They'll, they'll take a, an idea and they'll merge it with other pagan festivals to try to convert people to their, their way of thinking, and it's very successful. Uh, the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, or Samhain, uh, has been celebrated for thousands of years, and it's a day of the dead, and it's right around November. So it was, it was more beneficial to move All Saints Day, or All Hallows Day, to November 1st. Uh, and to this day, a large portion of Ireland, the Celtics are still Catholic. It's a very successful propaganda campaign. But that's where this holiday comes from. Uh, in, in Rome, the major pagan religion, the, the Greeks and the Romans, the major, what we think about when we think of pagan religion, uh, had Fernalia, which was around the same time. And it's another day of the dead, the day of the passing along of the dead. We have to know where these festivals, these traditions come from. There's nothing wrong with festivals or traditions if they're done correctly, if they're based in Jesus. That's why we have to know where these come from. I'll give you an example. We've, uh, we've all been to Halloween festivals or, ha or fall festivals where they do bobbing for apples. Where did that come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, actually, the Roman god of uh, Pomona is the goddess of, of uh, fruit and trees. Her symbol is an apple. And we have festivals dating back to around the time of Jesus. That's where bobbing for apples came from. It's a 2,000 year old festival to the goddess of, uh, of fruit and trees. Let me give you another example of knowing where these types of traditions and festivals come from. When uh, on Halloween night little kids come to your door, what do they do? They knock and say, trick or treat. Where did that come from? In the 1800s, uh, there was a large Irish Celtic immigration. If you remember, 1840 was the uh, Great Potato Famine. So around that time, we have large immigration from that, time, that part of Europe and Ireland over to the US. And they brought, as we mentioned, these Celtic festivals. They celebrated All Hallows Day. It's a very Catholic holiday, as I mentioned. It's very morbid, and it's a lot of fasting. So the day before holiday, what do you do? You go nuts. And there's a lot of partying and mischief, and that's just apparently what you do. 
which is where All Hallows' Eve became the festival. That was the night where you go out and you make mischief. It got to be a major problem. And uh, the youngsters of the day, the young Irish Celtic immigrants, were going around uh, vandalizing, tearing up property. It got to the point to where they would come and knock on your door and say, give us something or we'll tear up your stuff. Trick or treat. That's where that comes from. So every time our kids go up and knock on the door and say, trick or treat, that's what they're acknowledging. We have to know the history. We have to know where this stuff comes from. And why is it important? If you have your Bibles open, flip with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And I'm going to read from the New King James to make it a little easier. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Let me rephrase that a little bit. If you don't know how Satan works, he will take advantage of you. That's what he's here to do. Uh, if you, uh, you can flip to 1 Peter 5, 8. Most of you probably know it by heart. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, sinking whom he may devour. It's his purpose. It's what he's here to do. That's what he does. He wants to deceive you so you can be destroyed. I like to say that the devil builds his house one splinter at a time. Just a splinter here, a splinter there. You've heard, you may have heard the, uh, the old saying, what one generation tolerates, the next generation will accept. That's how the devil works, one splinter at a time until he gets a skyscraper. That's what he's done here. How many people have a, uh, how many people have a second thought about celebrating Halloween? You know, it's, it's for the kids, right? It's always for the kids. That's how he, that's how he gets in. Revelation 12, 9 says the devil deceives the whole world. That's his goal. That's his purpose. He lies. Not exactly by lying outright. No, he bends the truth. He likes to twist the truth. That's what he does. He adds to it. Think back to the story of, uh, the, in the uh, Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. When he goes up to Eve and, oh, are you sure that's what God really said? You won't surely die. He doesn't come out an outright lie. He likes to twist the truth. Little by little. One splinter at a time. Until you get a skyscraper. And that's where we're at now. Proverbs, verse 30. Three, uh, 5 and 6, excuse me. Proverbs, verse 30, 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who... Who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words. Lest he rebuke you. And you be found a liar. By scriptural definition. The devil is a liar. Satan is a liar. He adds to God's words. And by scripture. The word is the shield. We have to know the word of God. To shield ourselves. From the devices of Satan. It's the only way to protect ourselves. He takes God's perfect way. He corrupts it. He counterfeits it. He deceives. Mm. You know, there, there is, throughout the Bible, you have this common theme of the goodness of God, and then Satan will counterfeit. It's seen all over, all over the Bible. Uh, I've got to tell you right now, one of those examples would be the mark of the beast. With everything going on in our country today, which is insane, let's be honest, we're, we're at a place where the devil's running rampant. He has it his way. Uh, people are, are starting to ask questions, and I have seen more questions uh, or more theories about the mark of the beast in the last month and a half than I have my entire life. 
and they're wild too. Uh, people want to know legitimately what is the mark of the beast, but they don't know. And, if you, and we're not going to go in depth about the mark of the beast because it's too big a subject for today. I hope you've done the study or I hope you will do the study. There's no reason not to know. God doesn't hide things from us. Remember, God wants us to use his word as a shield to protect us. Throughout the Bible, we find evidence of what a sign or a mark is between God and his people. In, in Exodus 31, 13, feel free to look it up. The Sabbath is a sign. Exodus 13, uh, f- uh, 15 and 6, uh, another worship is a sign. It's, it's about worship. Ephesians 1, 13, worship. It's all about worship. And worship is a sign between God and his people. And then we get to Revelation 13 and we see the exact opposite. It's a counterfeit because he wants it for himself. The the Satan wants it for himself. He counterfeits. He corrupts God's good teachings. That brings us to our next holiday in the season. Once we get past Halloween, what's the next holiday? Thanksgiving, right? A lot of people's favorite holiday. My favorite as a, a growing up, for sure. Uh, the first hallo- the first, excuse me, Thanksgiving was celebrated in, uh, as we record history, is 1621. If you know your history, you'll remember that the Mayflower landed in 1620. So basically, and, and remember, please, the, the individuals coming on cross in the beginning, the Mayflower, these weren't business people. They weren't coming here to take advantage of anything. These were people that sold everything to flee Europe, to come to the, the, new, the new world and worship God as they thought he should be worshiped. Amen. That was the whole purpose of them coming. About 100 people came over on the Mayflower. 53 made it through the first year. Basically, they spent the first year living on the boat. They would come off the boat during the day and they would work. They would build houses, they built a town, they would cultivate fields, work land, and then they slept on the boat. They did that for about a year. And in 1621, for their autumn harvest, their first harvest they were able to to have, they had a three-day festival where they, they gave thanks to God. They had, I mean, they, last, they lost half of their population. But the first thing they did, as soon as they could, they had a three-day festival where they did nothing but give thanks to God. Come on, man. Come on. But is that what we do today? Not even close, is it? What's Thanksgiving about today? Football. Football. There we go. Shopping. Yeah. Last year, there was $11.6 billion spent online just Thanksgiving and Black Friday. Come on. Yeah. Uh, Somewhere between 80 and 90% of Americans will say they celebrate in some form Thanksgiving. But only 30% of Americans will travel to be with their family. So we're not going to spend time with our family because 70% of us are staying home. We're not going anywhere. So we're not spending time with our family. Uh, We're spending almost $12 billion online. I couldn't even find a real number for how much we spent in stores. I mean, it's, that's that much. And then what do we do? We, uh, when we do get together, we, we have this humongous feast and we stuff our face until we fall over and pass out. Gluttony. Gluttony, exactly. It's a celebration of gluttony and greed. That's not giving thanks to God. No. Hmm. If you're still in 2 Corinthians, I want you to look at uh, chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded? The God of this age is Satan. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He wants to confuse us. He wants to block the light from us so that we can't see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his whole purpose. That's how he's taken these, these festivals, these holidays, these traditions, and corrupted them to, from uh, where in the beginning this was a thing. This was a, uh, these people came across. They gave everything to be here, to worship God. And the first thing they did was they had a huge festival giving thanks. And now it's, it's corrupt. It's twisted. There's no glory to God. There has to be, though. Since you're still in 2 Corinthians, and I know you are, just flip over to the next chapter, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's it. If you're in Christ, you can't do those things because we're not the same. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Uh, James chapter 4, 7 and 8. Most people know this by heart. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw close to you. So if you're a new creation and you're in Christ, you have to be here. Which puts you farther away from the world. Because you can't be at both places at once. And that's what Christ constantly tells us. And that's what the devil knows. And which is why he tries so desperately to deceive us. Don't be like the world. Romans 12 verse 2 says again do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God don't be transformed don't be conformed to this world we can't be you can't be in two places at once you have to choose sides the devil knows that, and that's why he doesn't want us to think about it. That's the point. He doesn't want us to think about it. If you have your Bibles open, and I know you do, flip with me to 1 John. This is going to be one of the final scriptures I share with you today. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 18. 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 18. says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Stop right there a moment. It's not saying, doesn't mean that if you're believing in Jesus, you're never going to sin again. It means that you won't habitually sin. If you're in Christ, you don't want to sin. Amen. There are no perfect people, bar one, and he's not here yet. Or he's not coming back yet. He's not here yet. <laughs> right now, he's on his way back. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We know the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That's it. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And they don't even know it. Amen. That's the part. Until you come to Christ, you don't understand your sin. You don't understand the ways of the world because he has, count, the devil has counterfeited and made it so normal that to be out of the world and to be with Christ now is the abnormal. You know, I think it's interesting here that, that John ends this letter with a, a warning to keep yourselves away from idols. Little children, keep yourselves away from idols. Which we talked about pagan practices a little bit, but you know, it's 2020. We really don't have idols in, in our society today, do we? We don't have to worry about that. Except, you know, around Christmas time, 
We sure got some idols then, don't we? You know who I'm talking about. You know where we're going. Come on, everybody knows the rhyme. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Huh? Think about that rhyme for just a moment. Think about what we're teaching our kids about that rhyme. He knows what all children all over the world are doing at the same time. He's all-knowing. He must be everywhere all at once. He can go around the world all, and visit every home in the planet in one night. In, in less than one night, actually. Come on, man. If that's not the definition of an idol, I don't know what is. There's only one that's all-powerful. There's only one that is all places, all-knowing. And it ain't Santa Claus. Let's get real. And then to see churches, see people calling themselves Christians, having a Santa Claus decoration. A cutout of wood or stone in the form of an idol in front of a church, in front of a Christian's home. I bring this up in this way because what's the second commandment, people? Don't make for yourself any idols. But then we cut out images of Santa Claus and we put them in our homes. Put them on our, on our front door and our lawns, in front of our churches. I don't. I hope no one here does. But as Americans, we do. That's the culture we live in. Like it said, the devil has uh, the whole world's under the sway of the wicked one. Mm. And then it gets worse. It gets much worse. What do we do on Christmas Eve night? Yeah? Well, we leave milk and cookies out for Santa Claus. You know what the Bible calls that? A food and a drink offering for an idol. Amen. So good meaning, good intentioned people are leaving sacrifices for an idol out and not realizing it. This is the definition of spiritual warfare. Amen. The devil deceives. That's what he does. Uh, you know, uh, back to our opening scripture which was 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 through 12. It tells us what, what he does. Uh, we're going to look at 10 specifically uh, on with all unrighteousness, deception, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. We don't have the love of the truth. We don't have the love of Christ. We will be deceived. And it's happened. We see it in our nation. Uh, we, come on, 1621, when, when the first pilgrims arrived, they had no malintent. They gave everything to worship God in the way that they thought was biblically correct. Fast forward 400 years. We don't even think about God on Thanksgiving. That's how he works, one splinter at a time. Until he has a skyscraper. <laughs> Talking about Santa Claus, 43% of Americans, 2019, said they believe in Santa Claus. That's adults and children. 43% of Americans when asked. Only 60% of the U.S. will even say they believe in Jesus. Will even admit that they believe in Jesus. Come on. You know, we didn't talk about this, but we will when we bring our, our children to the mall to sit on Santa Claus's lap yeah. and offer their, their wishes to this image of an idol. That's the same as prayers. We're offering our prayers to an idol. Send letters through the mail. You're sending your wishes, your prayers, your thoughts, your feelings to an idol. This is spiritual warfare. And it can't be ignored. It can't be. There's too much on the line. Mm. You know, we're still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I just read 10. 11 says, For this reason God will send them a strong delusion that they may believe the lie. This doesn't mean that God's deceiving you. It's just like in Exodus with Pharaoh. If you choose to turn away from the truth, God allows you to be deceived. And 12, again, that they might be condemned 
who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's where I want to ask you today. Do we take pleasure in unrighteousness? Do we strive to have the truth? Do we strive to believe the truth? Do we strive to make sure our lives, our thoughts, line up with the truth that the Bible gives us? You know, a lot of people haven't thought about this like th uh, in this context. They're just holidays. This is how we grew up. It's, it's, just, it's just Thanksgiving. It's just Christmas. It's just Santa Claus. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It's spiritual warfare. These are spiritual battles that we fight. This is our part. God's given us the tools. The tools is Jesus Christ. That's the tool. That's the winning tool. So I hope if you've not made yourself ready, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you will. All right. And our closing hymn today is going to be hymn 213. Jesus is coming again.